New water. Neighbors are quiet. First video after the Patreon launch. Thanks to my friends over on Patreon for helping me decide which one I was going to post first. If you want to help me decide which video comes out next, have early access, and get updates on scripts I am working on, well, back me on Patreon. Anyway. So, I've been watching a shit ton of horror, right? And not even to cope. I've never been a horror guy in my life. Like, I once went through a haunted house gimmick with teary eyes shut tight. Over the past year in quarantine, though, I've kinda gotten into the genre. Less the thrill of it, and more with a morbid fascination and with a keen eye. How much of horror the genre is ableist fears persevering, you know? How much of it runs on old tropes that have been keenly ridiculed in 1996's Scream or 2011's Cabin in the Woods? What's the difference between Western horror and horror from the rest of the world? Needless to say, I've taken to the genre just as well as I've taken to video games, film, prose... I'm only viewing it through my interest in what it's actually trying to tell me. Horror the genre is incredibly elusive. Similar to mystery, any kind of horror is a product of its time in the context it was made in. In mysteries like procedurals or detective stories, the genre becomes a time capsule through which you'll see the kind of criminality that was rampant at the time it was made. And in properly backdating when and or pinning down where these mysteries take place, you can and will be able to understand how to solve the mystery yourself. The line to draw between horror and mystery, however, is deeply personal. At times, there is a mystery to horror. One where fucking around and finding out usually leads to, well, death. Whereas in non-horror mysteries like detective stories, you can sometimes relate to the horrific things people can be driven to do to survive, horror takes it up a notch and shows you the decisions or things you can barely even fathom to think about. But the creators of horror are still human. Like in reading H.P. Lovecraft's Bigoted Works, you can see the absolute terror this man used to live in. You can see how his bigoted view of society shaped the unfathomable, horrific creatures he was writing about. Long story short, every story is a product of authorial biases. Year, place, and assigned gender at birth, race, ethnicity, etc. All those, on top of the events surrounding the production of a story, can affect how a story is written and what message the writer is trying to deliver. And that's why you have horror satires and commentaries like Scream and Cabin in the Woods. People have come to understand what will likely be generated by these authorial biases. How jump scares are formulated, how the inclusion of an aspect like religion or monsters shape the story, or how certain writing decisions seem to be rooted in bigotry. So when I traipsed Ignorantly into Lee Janiac and Field Grazia Day's Netflix series Fear Street mid September. It's safe to say that I kind of had a macro lens with which to view the series already, and that was why Fear Street kind of pleasantly surprised me. What is Fear Street? Fear Street, originally a teen horror fiction book series by R.L. Stein, is a Netflix horror trilogy that came out on the 2nd, 9th, and 16th of September 2021. It features a town called Shadyside and a group of teens who end up reawakening the infamous local not really legend witch, Sarah Fear. They get into some shenanigans trying to undo the curse put upon them while trying to survive the days that follow. It has sapphics, time jumps, mostly all white casualties, God bless, and a lot of gore. Like I am talking head in a bread slicer, severed hand, fractured knee, eyes gouged out, all of it. You are not avoiding the gore in this series. Above all else though, Fear Street had a lot to say about poverty, queerness, misogyny, capitalism, and well, it had a lot to say about systemic oppression. But before we get into that, a few disclaimers. I never read the Fear Street books. Upon researching for the script, writer-director Janiac did actually say there wasn't a lot borrowed from the book series anyway, but it can't hurt to put a disclaimer here. If you're a Stein fan, more power to you, but this video is mostly a just 
about the series. I will be talking spoilers for all of Fear Street, and I will not be holding back. <laughs> this is an analysis of the plot, so you might want to watch all of it to understand what's about to happen here. I'll probably post like a list of content warnings if you want to come in. I know Janiac really wanted to do an homage to a lot of horror movies. Like I said though, I only recently got into horror media, so I will probably will just end up not alluding to them and more to media I'm more accustomed to, to really get to the barest bones of explaining what made the series so interesting to me. <sighs> Alright, with that out of the way, I'm going to break down why some horror stories usually don't work for me, and how and why Fear Street broke those molds. Let's go. Degeneracy begets punishment. Often in horror stories, death functions moralistically. I've tried to analyze this before, even poked fun at it. Most of the time, audiences will care more about an animal death than a character death, and that's usually because of one very specific thing. People read morality into agency. Young characters and animals often don't have it in horror stories. One way or another, the audience or the creators see that young characters and animals are pure, and therefore, their deaths are a lot more sickening. Lack of awareness of the threat and zero sins towards any likable characters equals purity. And that's why, so often in horror movies, you get to see an array of usually unlikable characters. They're death potter. They die and they deserve it. Horror has a track record of having an array of degenerate characters. Criminals, promiscuous characters that are often queer-coded or are explicitly queer. People with mental health disorders that make them unlikable or antisocial. Misogynist stereotypes of women. Overly arrogant and oftentimes self-absorbed assholes. These are the type of people we never mourn, according to horror films. They're the death father. In Fear Street 1994, the first installment of the series, it establishes that Shadyside is the poorer town compared to Sunnyvale. Its citizens have to work three to four jobs to keep stable, some of which are illegal. Shadyside is the killer capital in this universe. A lot of serial killers and mass murderers come from this side of town, and though that comes with its in-universe explanations too, the writing and the camera don't shy away from showing you the reality of that. Kate and Simon, two of the main protagonist's best friends deal drugs. They joke about the death of their fellow schoolmate, they make light of the rumor that the deaths are related to a witch's curse and seem to just not care. Kate makes the kids she babysits sort pills into bags she makes Simon deal for her. Simon keeps selling drugs despite the fact that his brother Tim almost overdosed. Simon makes moves on multiple women in visible distress, one of which almost killed him, but he still manages to objectify afterwards. The scene is played for laughs. He makes fun of Josh for being a nerd. They're literally a cheerleader in the football team's mascot. It's close enough. If Simon's dumb and jacked enough to be a jock stereotype. The thing is, they're not good people. They're framed with having checked most of horror media's this is why you deserve to die bingo card. Obviously, they're gonna die, right? Right. And they actually do, too. Yeah, I thought you said Fear Street was breaking the mold. Okay, get this? They die, but it's after you've empathized and spent time with them already. Yes, they say and do mean and horrible things, but they're teenagers. They're children. I mean, <laughs> look at this casting. They look that young on purpose. Those are kids. Human beings. Kate was smart and clever. She was loyal to Dina and wanted her to be happy instead of just sulking about Sam all the time. She took interest in Josh because he's smart and kind, not out of pity. She was a captain of every org in school. Excuse me? Which one of us is valedictorian again? No president of every club this shithole has to offer. When dealing drugs because she wanted to get out of shady side. Simon was loyal and brave. He was supportive of his friends and was supporting his family through drug dealing. But when they die in the story, the Sunnyvale police take the side of the usual horror audience. They're just two drug dealers caught dead in a grocery store, leaving three survivors from Shadyside and a trail of bodies from the hospital. Of course they did it. Of course they deserve to die. Who knows how many lives they've ruined due to addiction. Yet they get in-movie sympathy for it. 
Dean and Josh are mad about the fact that they died and were vilified, that pinning it on two teens who turned to drug dealing to try and get out of poverty was the easy answer the police wanted and got. Fucking ACAP. Dina said it best near the end of 1994. Another shady side tragedy. An underprivileged overachiever with bright prospects. A guy who's been supporting his family alone since he was 15. Both succumbing to the quick cash of drugs fits the narrative, right? Nice and neat. Every installment of this series encompasses those same themes. 1978 takes the time to humanize both Arnie and Alice, who were both just teens acting up because of their circumstances. People thought Nurse Lane, Ruby Lane's mother, was delusional due to Ruby's massacre and suicide, that their psychotic breaks run in the family, or that she was the reason why her daughter snapped. But the characters' disbelief of that theory is what saves them, and Nurse Lane ends up living until 1994. 1666 reveals that Sarah Fear's death wasn't because she was an actual witch, but because she was a vengeful girl whose youth and love was stolen from her, because she wasn't allowed to have a meaningful life, because she was blamed for the death of her own brother and childhood friends, because she prevented an assault, and because she was queer at the wrong time. This subversion breaks the mold of vilifying and criminalizing degeneracy or any unnaturalness. And that's… the bar is literally on the ground, but that's significant. This is a horror movie with a lot of tragedy, but the people who deserve to die, according to the horror bingo card, are sympathetic. And most of them make it till the end. In your face, Damacus Arca. The black person dies first. I have to address this again, I know the bar is on the ground. And a lot of horror movies have subverted this already, mainly ones made by black creators like Nia DaCosta and Jordan Peele. But the fact that Dina and Josh are, I think they're both biracial. You never really see who their mom is and it's implied that she died and in 1666 they had a white guy play their dad so I think they're both biracial. Anyhow, for both of them to be the final siblings, so to speak, is just incredible to me. It's sort of the same rant I have about Sam and Dina both getting to the end of the series at all. <laughs> the bar is on the floor, but this one, this one stepped over it. Maybe even raised it a little, considering this was made by white cishet creators and they were given enough advertising to create hype lured the clout in by casting Sadie Sink and Maya Hawk and hit you with not one, but two characters of color who will be carrying this series to its conclusion. Josh is the nerdy introvert type who seems like he'd give you this sort of insult vibe because he was literally introduced while he was role-playing on AOL, <laughs> but no, he ends up being the sweetest, most awkward brains of the team who developed into being brave enough to stand up to a bunch of immortal serial killers to buy time for his sister. He gives exposition, comes up with these big harebrained schemes with Dina, he gets the girl in 1994, and well his parallel dies in 1666. R.I.P. Henry Fear. And it wasn't really established anywhere that Sarah had family, but it's whatever. Dina is a strong and upstart firecracker. She, you can tell she aged a lot faster because they live in a single parent household, but she's still incredibly vulnerable, still yearns for something as simple as having burgers and soda with her girl. And throughout the series, you just see her fight tooth and nail to keep everyone she loves alive. At first glance, it seems like she has the least development in the series, but she learns to listen and empathize and learns to rein in her impulsivity and she steps out from seeing shady side as a gravity well and uncovers the truth to Sarah Fear's curse. Like these two really tie the series in a bow. Biracial characters, like one of which is explicitly queer. And okay, there is a bit of colorism going on. <laughs> Khadija made a long video about colorism in media that y'all should check out to really get the gist of why this casting is weird because I mean, come on, 
I respect Kiana Madeira. She did an excellent job as Sarah Fear and Dina Johnson. Her emotional range is just... But why is she light-skinned? Why? Just, just go watch Khadija's video. You'll understand. It's in the cards. It's in the description. It's your assignment. It's not my job to repeat what black people have said already. <laughs> Intangible fear. See, there's this thing I hate in stories in general where they try to nudge the audience, not subtly, into epiphanizing without properly setting up the payoff. And they always give you these glaring hints that come out of left field, like in the middle of a climax where they feel so random and out of place. It's weird because that's not... So that's not how you're supposed to write a mystery. Red over on Overly Sarcastic Productions actually explained it best in her trope talk about detectives. Hiding too much information from the audience can be seen as a sign of bad faith on the part of the author. If the audience couldn't reasonably guess the solution from the information given, it's a violation of mystery convention. For instance, if the killer is a hitherto unmentioned character who just happened to be in the area, that's completely plausible and it might even make more sense in context than any of the main cast doing it, but it's not a fair conclusion to a mystery that's supposed to be fair to the audience. All these things serve to undercut the integrity of the mystery plot. These stories usually feel worse for the audience to engage with. They also sometimes don't make much sense in hindsight, since without enough information in the story to piece it together, it might not actually hold together. Writing a mystery is hard. You usually have to do it backwards from the way it's presented in the plot, starting from the crime and working through what clues and hints that crime would leave, rather than starting from the mystery and figuring out who would make the best criminal as you go. If the writer sets up a mystery without actually knowing the solution beforehand, the story is not going to hold together as well. And if the writer does know the mystery going into it, but drops like tiny, tiny clues that don't actually combine to form the bigger picture, that kind of has the same problem, where the audience can't really engage with the mystery because they don't have enough information. These writing choices in big budget horror films always feel so contrived, especially if it's a twist ending. You come out of it and see people saying that it's supposed to be new weird, that you're not supposed to even see the forest for the trees or something like that. New weird horror is supposed to be unfathomable. Intangible fears. But that's... I mean, that's a choice you can make. I'm just saying you can do it better. You know, intangible fear only works if you can actually invoke it in your audience. This all ties back to horror mysteries, really, because let's be real, that's what Fear Street is, right? Every installment of this series is a contained mystery leading up to the biggest mystery. What happened to Sarah Fear, and why do these killers keep coming back from the dead to possess and kill shady siders? And in most horror films, they won't even give you enough to answer that mystery. Because it's a curse. It's pent up anger from a long dead woman you pissed off. It doesn't choose victims, right? For a moment there in 1978, it seemed like they were doing just that. Dina reunites Sarah's hand with her body and it seems like they're going to be ending the film there. Then she gets sent back in time as Sarah feared to relive the days leading up to Sarah's death. And it is just a breathtaking show-don't-tell decision on top of them reusing their actors to play Sarah Fear and the other children of the town of Union. Shady side in Sunnyvale before the divorce. And they walk you through the night Sarah's hand was taken from her, the dawn of her execution, and the curse she put on not the townsfolk but Solomon Good. That the truth will come out eventually, no matter how long it takes, that she'll try to whisper it to any shady cider willing to listen on the days the goods offer up a name to the book. I've seen the reviews about this twist. They all go, Oh, it's kind of disappointing because it feels like they're tying up all the loose ends. Like that's a bad thing? Dude, you're ending a story. You're supposed to tie up the loose ends. It's like these people have never heard of a good story. Because the heart of it, the horror of Fear Street, isn't about the mystery of a witch's curse. Or the immortal serial killers that come back every few years. Sure, most of the adrenaline comes from those aspects, when Ziggy's nose bled on that hand and they paralleled it with Dina doing the exact same thing. <laughs> I was petrified. Like, girls, wear a damn mask next time. But... The actual horror of Fear Street is about systemic oppression and the blatant disregard for the sanctity of human life regardless of the morality of their action. Fearing that is intangible too. When you see corruption and look back on years and years and years of it, from 
people you never even expected it from, people you trusted to protect you, that you can't even fathom how many lives this corruption has ruined, how many people died because of it, for the gain and well-being of only a few people? That's terrifying. Where do you even begin? But Fear Street gives you hope that in the end, the truth will always come out. That if we guide one generation after the other, eventually we'll be able to break a curse. <laughs> That's beautiful. Whew, that... <laughs> if that didn't convince you to watch Fear Street, well, I never said I was a type to get people into things. It does sound a bit corny when you get to the end. Most people really like their mysteries to just, you know, give you this sense of dread because that's cathartic or something. I don't understand it, but, you know. <laughs> if you like that, again, please consider backing me on Patreon or just sending me a Kofi. I'll even draw something for you. I'm currently aiming to get a new keyboard set up because writing hurts, man. My hands can't keep doing this. So if you can spare some change, please help. Thanks again to my friends and patrons. Without them, this video and the next one won't be coming out. Shout out to Jeanette. You're a real one, bestie. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe. Bye!